Mercy. Israel Hamas war draws fury in the Middle East, affecting the world at large. And countdown to Imo, Kogi, and Bayelsa Guba elections. I am Bola, Oba, and this is Plus Politics. On October 7, militants from Gaza, known as the Hamas Group, invaded Israel and fired thousands of rockets towards the towns, killing more than 1,400 people, including civilians and soldiers, and also taking 199 hostages. In response to the attack, Israel has declared war and launched Operation Sword of Iron, striking what it says are Hamas and Jihad. Islamic Jihad targets in Gaza. It has also blocked supply lines of basic necessities to the Gaza population, including fuel and water. On October 17, hundreds of people were fed dead after an explosion at a hospital in the Gaza Strip where people sought refuge. The Gazan Health Ministry, which is run by Hamas, put the toll at 471 people killed and hundreds more injured. Hamas, Palestinian officials and several Arab leaders have accused Israel of eating the hospital and Israel on the other hand has denied this, saying the preliminary evidence pointed to a local militant group. However, several world leaders have pledged their support to Israel and are pushing to get aid flowing into the Gaza Strip. Joining me to discuss this and how the world at large has been affected by the war is Ambrose Igbokwe, Chairman, Guild of Public Affairs Analyst of Nigeria, Enugu State Branch. Ambrose, good to have you guesting on Plus Politics virtually. Good evening. Thanks for having me on the show. Pleasure is all mine, to be honest with you. Uh, Ambrose, the unfolding trage tragedy in the Middle East is somewhat disturbing. Disturbing enough that a lingering problem, almost 75 years in the making now, uh, locally is, as it does occasionally, spreading far beyond the borders of Israel to the Middle East. And indeed, one may reasonably say that apart from the incoherence, the seeming incoherence of the monetary and fiscal authorities in Nigeria, it may be one of the factors also leading now to four queues on the streets of Lagos. How would you want to respond to that? It's something that I think uh, the global community including the United Nations, as a prosecution about for uh, basically uh, 75 years now. When the state of Israel was created in 1948 as a fallout of the Second World War, one would have expected that whatever taking problems that it had then would have been over after 75 years. But no. We had war around that area with the, the Arab neighbors, with Israel, that, that immediately after that creation of the uh, Israeli states. We had a very major war in 1967, where the Golan Heights was captured by Israel. We had a major war called the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And after that, there have been pockets of skirmishes. Between 1973 and now, in 60 years. But the world kept mounting it. We keep talking about it in conferences. United Nations keep talking about it in Security Council meetings. The world keeps on going around in merry go round about the matter. But there have been no, you know, stopping it. We had a Camp David Accord 
We had the solution in terms of two-state solution. We have had all kinds of prescriptions to the effect of the middle war crisis. Yet it persisted. So that comes to say something clearly. That the world does not want to solve the problem in the Middle East. Let me tell you what has happened. In the, between, the 19, between the time of Lenin, Stalin, and the rest, who have brought communism, we had the USSR. If the world was able to witness the collapse of the Soviet Union and each of the states that constituted the Soviet Union actually disintegrated with demarcated boundary lines and sovereignty and territorial sovereignty established. I don't know why just two states, Israel and Palestine boundary, cannot be defined oh, and two state solution provided. Uh, Ambrose. Czechoslovakia Ambrose. divided into 13 countries. Uh, uh, and so many of them, you know, from a distance. Uh, uh, Soviet, Soviet uh, country. Ambrose. So I want to maintain that the war in the uh, Middle East between Israel and Palestine is the world is using it and just mounting it. There's no serious would you not, issues. Would you, would, you, would you not think that it is actually the recalcitrance of the two parties, of the two local parties, that may be the problem far more than the enthusiasm of the world to help them solve it. Because if you really look at it, uh, from, from 1948, when the United Nations initially came up with the idea of two-state solution and the Arabs rejected it uh, until uh, a, a, a rehash of the two-state solution came into being about, uh, about one and a half to two decades ago that the Israelis are now pussyfooting on it. Uh, look at the situation thus far. In the last 10 years of, of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister's in and out rule, he had always made sure that everything that would enhance the materialization of the or manifestation of the two-state two -state solution, he had always played against it. In fact, using it to enhance the relevance of Hamas at the expense of the PA, Palestinian Authority. So I would want to think that is more of the more of the stubbornness, the edginess and the recalcitrant of the two parties, Israelis and, and Palestinians, that has brought us to this uh, no win, no gain uh, situation. How would you respond to that? Well, you know, what, what, what I can say is this. There are instances where the world did not wait for two parties to agree before they stepped in. Remember, we have had territorial wars over this last 75 years. We have had even bigger issues of apartheid in South Africa. We have had boundary issues. Remember in 2001, Eritrea, and Ethiopia were at each other's throat. And they were left to, they, they were, there was a bad international people came and agreed on a two state solution. And it went their way. You remember also that just recently, South Sudan was split into two. International people moving. Look at the intensity at which the West and they uh, are looking at the issues of uh, Ukraine and Russia. Why is Russia being vilified? Because Russia invaded another country with territorial uh, boundaries. At this stage we are, the world as United Nations should not wait for Palestine and uh, Israel. First of all, with Hamas. Hamas is a non-state terrorist organization. Are you telling me that the world does not have what it takes to root out Hamas the way ISIS uh, and, and, and Al-Qaeda was rooted out? Yeah, but so something you, you, was deficient somewhere. You, you must Why have, Hamas, first of all, 
a North Fed actor, a terrorist organization, is allowed to run a big swath of the country. Uh, uh, Ambrose, uh, uh, Ambrose that, that is a perfect place to actually interject. You will agree, you will agree with me that if the two parties were to be honest, initially, initially it was the the Palestinians that were rejecting the two-state solution because under President Clinton, there were fantastic opportunities for the PLO to, to work with the arrangement of the two-state solution, but Arafat kind of um, was reluctant to engage with it. Now, in the last 10 to about 14 years, especially since uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has become the Prime Minister in and out of Israel, he has deliberately, deliberately played to a strategy that has made, apart from the corruption of the PLO and apart from the inadequacies, the seeming senility of the leader of the PLO, of the PLO he has actually played a hand that enhances the relevance of Hamas because of the strategy to make PLO irrelevant until this attack that kind of uh, poo pooed is a uh, strategy of playing divide and rule between Hamas and the PLO. So I'm sitting there now thinking uh, if there is going to be a solution. In, in the Middle East, especially in Israel, between Israel and, and the Palestinians, the two parties and the, uh, and the extremes of the two parties, Hamas being the extreme of the Palestinians and Benjamin Netanyahu and his ultra-rightist uh, coalition partners must be sober enough to know that this situation cannot last more so the world may need to press on them but in so much as Hamas can be rightly referred to as a criminal terrorist organization we must also accept the fact that even in Israel some politicians in Israel play to the ultra-rightist wing fundamentalist wing of Judaism and Zionism that, that, that will accord the situation there to be to be peace, peacefully solved. How would you respond to that? You see, uh, I, I get all your explanation. We know the power play. We know that if there is peace in the Middle East today, we know that if there is peace between the Palestinians and Israelis today, some people will have a business. Hamas will be out of business. So Hamas and its backers, like Iran, we always want to be escalation of crisis between Israel and Palestine. Now, the point of my position has always been this. When did the world start tolerating criminality? Because criminality has been fought even in intercontinental water. Pirates have been decimated. The other time, the pirates were really disturbing the movement of vessels in some certain speed. There was a collaboration international uh, community, and most of those pirates were decimated. When 9-11 happened, United States and the world did not wait for the terrorists to agree to have a solution. They went in and decimated them. Now, the Middle East crisis, if it is caused as it's now done by terrorist organizations, my question is why has the world not joined Israel in removing Hamas that is causing the problem? Do you know how many people this crisis has killed? Uh, Ambrose. The Palestinian government, ruled by uh, Abbas, said they don't have a hand in this. 
So he fought the Palestinian people that is fighting this war. He's a terrorist organization for Hamas. Uh, uh, Why Ambrose. has the world not taken out Hamas? Uh, uh, Ambrose. And that is the double standard I see here. Uh, Ambrose. Each time we talk about this war. Uh, Ambrose. I, I think it may be imperative at this juncture to let you also come to the realization that Hamas came into, into relevance as a result of a democratic choice of the Gazans because Hamas may be an extremist organization so much so as you have extremist organizations within the Israeli polity, but Hamas came into control of Gaza as a result of the democratic choice of Gazans in an election. Am I right about that? Yeah, you are complicated. So uh, we must be very careful when we are referring to Hamas as a terrorist organization. I've got no problem with it, to be honest with you, with, with some of the things they've done, especially the 7th of, of October attack on Israel. But having said that, there are equally parties, political parties within the Israeli polity that is almost as worse in some of their machinations against the solutions that the world is trying to profile in that direction as a mass. So, but we need to quickly uh, look at the implications of this in the world. Uh, my brother, the price of crude has gone up because, like I said earlier on, because of inco the, the seeming incoherence of monetary and fiscal policy in Nigeria, the Naira is depreciating. And because, because the pump price of petroleum products, PMS, AGO, and all the O's are now, are now deregulated, inevitably prices will go up and because the government is still living in some form of delusion pretending that is not paying is not paying subsidy a lot of potential importers as a result of the conflicting realities of the depreciating naira and the fact that the international price of crude is going up are not bringing in crude and now we are having queues again in Lagos, in Abuja, I wouldn't know what is happening in Enugu, where you are. How would you, how would you respond to this as a backlash or one of the, one of the global disruptions that the unfortunate situation in Israel is causing? <laughs> Bola, um, there was a video I saw two years ago that was show, showing square scarcity in Nigeria, I think in 1973. Long queues. Now, Nigeria worked hard to come out of that by building refineries. Three gigantic refineries. One in Port Harcourt, one in Wari, and one in Kaduna to service the country. And we're having sufficient oil for like 20 years or so. We refine our crude for local consumption. We would export refined oil to neighboring African countries. All of a sudden, we invite the structural adjustment program. And all our industries started collapsing. Even our refining capacity collapsed. And all of a sudden, we started ex exporting crude oil and importing petroleum, refined petroleum products. That is the most mad, or let me use the uh, language countdown. Mind your language, the maddest, we are on national TV. That is the maddest, no, I'm not, it's not any modern language, it's just a, a downstream language. It's the maddest economics I've ever seen. Because it is good economics. To export your own product that you produce, go to another country, pay a foreign currency, and then use foreign currency again to import it. You pay to export, you pay a foreign currency to refine, 
you pay in foreign currency again to import. And because the government of the day found out that the madness is not sustainable, and there was inflation in the cost of consuming such refined products in Nigeria, they introduced subsidy. That government recognizes that it has failed in its responsibility to refine crude oil in Nigeria. We will pay for the difference. That is how subsidy came. Uh, now, uh, whatever was... that has happened to the subsidy, whether it was a scam or it was not scam, the government was supposed to work hard to sanitize the subsidy system since there was no refinery working in the country. But they didn't do it. The government knows those who are involved in the subsidy because it is their friends or they are afraid to go after the cabal. They are now transferring the suffering to the Nigerian masses. Because how do you explain that the government came in without no clear economic roadmap, no strategy to remove first subsidy? The best way to remove first subsidy is to first of all find out what is happening to the petroleum industry act. Why are people not setting up what are the finalists after getting a license? There must be a problem. The government was supposed to remove that problem and allow modular refineries to run in the country. Give this like an 18 month gestation period or two years so that we can have a preponderance of modular refineries and then our products can be refined locally. That will automatically bring down the costs. That will save us forex of exporting crude or paying uh, to a refining of crude in a foreign land and of bringing it back. It takes us huge for it. And now, uh, government did not do that. Government just announced that what is gone. Now, while we are still talking about the attendant hardship of that, the people who used to import the uh, refined products, the concession of the exchange rate they get from the CBN, will cancel it. I said everybody should, be, should go to the Malam. Ambrose, I really, I really enjoy, I really enjoy this, but we must go now. The tyranny, the tyranny of time, is really eating hard. I would love, to, I would have loved to engage you further. Some of the very important and very interesting points uh, you were making, but uh, we really have to go. Ambrose, I really want to thank you. For guesting on on the show, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bola, for having me. Thank you. This is where we go for a short break, and the next segment is going to be about the off cycle gubernatorial elections in Imo, Bayelsa, and Kogi. It's going to be interesting. Thank you. <laughs>